the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. And today, I'm lucky enough to be with Diana McDonough. Diana, could you give us a 60-second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Sure, Allison. Thank you for having me on today. Um, my name's Diana McDonough. I'm the mother of three and the grandmother of 14. I retired from Ecolab Chemical Sales in 2016 in order to write full time. And um, I've done a lot of things in the past with volunteering. I helped to create the Ecolab E3 Women's Advocacy Group. It's a Fortune 500 company that um, E3, I'm sorry, Ecolab is. And I also founded Woman to Woman Global. It was a nonprofit company, nonprofit organization that helps to scholarship women and provide laptops for them to further their education. I'm also a volunteer at a local elementary school and have a special heart for special needs children. And I invite you to see my blog, The Summer of Juan and Pedro, which talked a lot about that. I love to write. I always have ever since I was a child. And of course, the bills and all that, raising children come in the middle of everything. So I wrote in my spare time and I wrote Stuck in the Warranties, my first novel. And it took me 10 years of writing while I was still working for Ecolab. So when I retired in 2016, I took up writing full time and they wanted a sequel to Stuck in the Warranties. And I wrote My Mother's Apprentice, which is the story of the daughters, one of which I am. And then um, I just released my third novel, which is a prequel to Stuck in the Onesies called Ginger Star. It's historical fiction based in the 1720s Jamaica during the Golden Age piracy. And I'm really excited about that. And I can't wait to hear what everybody has to think about it. All right. I am wanting to understand the timeline of the three novels. So we, we wrote Stuck in the mm-hmm. Onesies, and that is loosely based on you, or is it a memoir? Actually, Stuck in the Onesies is creative nonfiction. It's based on my mother and a good friend of hers and raising children in the 1960s, Washington, D.C. When women's rights, civil rights, and the Vietnam War protests were all going on, uh, they got caught up in the vortex of change with all of those things happening. They're kind of like Donna Reed style housewives and mothers and um, were trying to be independent in their own way without burning a bra. So it's a great story. It allows um, a lot of people to learn stuff about the 1960s when things first broke loose with protests and such, and shows how far we've come, but also shows how far we have yet to go. All right. So then we we fast forward with the second novel, and that's the one that is more loosely based on your experiences. On my yes, that's right. My mother, my mother's apprentice, is the sequel to Stuck in the Onesies. The readers wanted a sequel. So actually I put aside my third book, Ginger Star, to do the My Mother's Apprentice book. And that's loosely based on my friendship with one of the daughters that was in the story and stuff in the onesies. It deals with addiction and abortion and all types of women's issues that we still deal with today. This particular book, My Mother's Apprentice, starts out and takes place about half of it in Jamaica back in the 1970s when Bob Marley first came out. And one of the um, characters in there becomes a reggae rock star, rock star, which obviously is not me. So I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But at any rate, again, I say it's creative nonfiction because I have changed it up a lot. But the thread of the story is true. A lot of the the relationship between the two daughters is true and um, comes to fruition in modern day times. So it it takes you through a lot, a lot of... um, Book clubs really enjoy these books because there's a lot of great discussion points regarding things back then and how they've evolved to today and how far we need to go. Also, that I'd sounds like to wonderful. And then you... bit, uh, I'm sorry. I'd like to rewind a little bit back to Stuck in the Onesies. It deals a lot with racism. When I first started writing it, I sent a couple of chapters to my sister to review to get her opinion. And she sent um, an email back. She said, Diana, it sounds great. She says, but our parents were racist. Get over it and write about it. So I figured, well, if she can handle it, then I can too. So I went back and became much more honest with the storyline and the characters and how they viewed the world. 
and um, shows their evolution over a period of 30 years and how they changed their views as well. So it just shows that people can change. You just have to give them the opportunity. Well, that's a really interesting comment because the world does move. The, the world does move. And where we live today, how we live today is so different than it was 30, 40, 60 years ago. It sure is. Back then, you know, in the 1960s, we had easy access to the White House and things that were going on down there. It's not like it is today where there's so much security and stuff. So there were times when you could run into someone famous and you'll see that in stuff in the onesies. You'll meet some famous people and uh, experience a lot of the things that the ladies went through. But um, things have changed a lot, but not as much as I thought. And I'll explain that more when we talk about Ginger Star. Well, let's talk about Ginger Star. So this was Ginger Star is a prequel, but it's a, a big leap back. Correct, correct. I've always loved historical fiction. And I was um, writing Ginger Star when the readers wanted the second book in My Mother's Apprentice. So I put it aside. And after I finished Apprentice, I went back to Ginger Star. It's based in 19, or I'm sorry, in the 1720s, back in the golden age of piracy in Jamaica. And I had written the book. I was about a little over three quarters done, and I was getting ready to go back to Jamaica for one last mission, not mission trip, but uh, research trip. And 2020, and that was COVID, it hit. And needless to say, I never made that trip. So I thought, well, I'll just finish the book up at home. And I started to do that. And then the murder of George Floyd occurred. And it just hit me right between the eyes. And I realized that I had not dealt with the slavery and plantation issues like I should have in Ginger Star. So I went back to the writing block, writing board, and just started uh, working on that and trying to be more transparent with how things were back then. And hopefully I did a good job. Some people that have read it thought that I did. So I'm anxious to see what everyone thinks. It's, uh, slavery was an awful, awful thing to have to write about. Very difficult. and. Um, when I had it edited, I remember my editor saying, well, it seems like you rushed through this theme a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, I did, because I don't like writing about it. So I'd have to go back and beat it up some. So hopefully everybody will agree that it's more realistic. And um, it's not worry or anything like that, but I tried to be real with how things happened and the way people felt about things on both sides. I'd also talked a lot about um, a group called the Maroons, which is um, a tribe of escaped slaves and Taino Indians back in the day. And uh, the British could never beat them. And they ended up in a treaty with them. But in the meantime, um, they raided plantations and caused a lot of chaos throughout. And in the modern day times, the Maroons still exist up in the middle of the mountains in Jamaica. I've been to one of their villages and hope to go to another one next month. But um, there's a lot of uh, history there and a lot of interesting things that I thought the public would want to know about. Wow, that, that is fascinating. Uh, Diana, how do you sit down and, and work up the courage to write about difficult subjects? Well, that, that is that's a good question. And it's funny with the stories that I've written, the first two basically were based on real life. So I had somewhat of an outline to go by. But with Ginger Star, I didn't. It was more of a flying by the seat of my pants thing and learning as I went along, doing a lot of research and figuring out what was going on. But the difficult subjects is just a part of life, and they always have been and always will be. And writing about them for myself helped me to understand things better. And also, you know, going back to the first book I wrote, which is a lot about my parents, was a way for me to therapeutically process the loss of them and also learn from their lives and other people around them. And you, you mentioned the idea that when you first started writing, you weren't as deep as you could be when you explored the subject. So right. having to go back into that place where you felt like you did an okay job, but then you have to really get in there and, and as you mentioned, beat it up. Um, what does right. that require? I mean, did, did you do a lot of research? Uh, oh, yeah, a whole lot of research about the period of time and what was going on. Um, stuck in the onesies, the first book, I was a kid at the time when the book, you know, when the book begins. And at first I read it in the first person, the first couple of chapters. And then I realized I really couldn't tell the story I wanted to tell 
because I was telling it from the child's point of view. So I put it aside. I took some writing classes, did some um, writers conferences, and then I went back, started over again in the third person and went back and forth between my mother's point of view and her best friend's point of view, chapter by chapter. So I had to wait until I felt like I could really get into her head and her sarcasms and her senses of humor and all of that um, to make it work. And I think it did. I think uh, the research helps a lot. Going to critique groups and writers conferences is certainly a big help to keep me on task and, and give me advice. And then after, um, my editor, the editor that I have now, Bill Cecil, has been great for me. I've learned a lot from him in the process of living under his tutelage. Well, yeah, the, the value of a of a good editor is worth every cent. Mm. <laughs> it certainly is. It certainly is. It's not cheap, but it is definitely worth every cent. And like I said, I've learned a lot from him. So not only does he correct things, but he teaches me things. I mean, we're, we're all up for learning. And writing is forever evolving. When I first started writing, you had to have an agent and a publishing house and all that. And now everything you can do on your own if you choose. So that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Yeah, it is a whole different conversation. What was your path to publishing? My path to publishing, like I said, when I started stuck in the onesies, you had to have an, an agent and a publishing house and all of that. But I shelved the book after, but until I retired, I finished it. I just put it on the shelf until 2016. So when I came back to that and writing full time, things had changed and you can self publish easily. And I thought, well, heck, you know, it can take a couple of years to get an agent. You can get an agent that's pitching it, can't sell it. And heck, I could be dead by then. So I just decided to self-publish. I've been in sales and marketing with Ecolab for 26 years. So I'd learned a good bit about marketing. And I thought it would be just as simple. But I quickly found out that selling books and selling chemicals are two different things. But a lot of the same things still apply. You just keep pushing, doing as much as you can. I've now got a marketing firm doing a lot of work for me to help me launch Ginger Star, and hopefully that will help me to gain more national exposure. I do have book clubs that really enjoy my books, and I've met with book clubs from Florida up to Canada, both in person and in Zoom. So if anybody out there has a book club and they're interested, let me know. I'm happy to meet with you in person or in Zoom. And uh, I do go to Florida in the winter because it's too darn cold up here where I live in Maryland. So um, I have both markets there and they're going very well. Book clubs in both areas really enjoying the series. How did you get connected with book clubs? Um, well, you know, I thought when I retired, I thought, well, you know, they are, I can just send out an email blast to all these book clubs and they'll jump all over my book. Well, that isn't how it goes. I've quickly found out that when you, um, when you want to approach a book club, you have to have somebody that believes in your book to pitch it and, and select it for the club. So whenever I was doing book signings and such, I would ask people if they belonged to a book club. If they said yes, I would follow up with them. And as a result, I've become a part of many, many book clubs and develop, that helps you to develop your reader base and your fan base. So as you go along, it gets a little bit bigger each time. And they're, they're very, I love attending book clubs. They really energize me. Uh, other than just the wine, I enjoy that part too. But, um, but they really energize me with their questions and their comments and makes you feel like going back to the laptop, start writing some more because uh, it can be very encouraging. They can also, you know, be very, it can be critical. And that's what a writer needs. We need somebody to be honest with us and tell us, you know, hey, it took me a long time to get into this book or it didn't or this is where I felt it fell short. It helps you along for your next project. I really enjoy it. What has been the most interesting question that a book club has asked? Oh my, most interesting question. Wanting to know which scenes were true and which ones weren't. So sometimes I answer them, sometimes I don't. <laughs> but um, wanting, yeah, wanting to know, you know, that the question about abortion and the questions about addiction and how it affects families and and relationships and uh, wanting to know how I made it through that with my friend and the things that she was going through in the second book but um, there's always a difficult question here and there and you can always tell when somebody thinks that uh, 
wow, you told too much of somebody else's story. But, and I remember with my second book, um, feeling kind of bad that um, I was telling my friend's story so frankly, but I found a journal entry that I'd made in my computer when she was still alive. And I asked her uh, what she wanted her name to be in the book. And she didn't hesitate. She said, Ginger, because she looked like Ginger and uh, Gillian's Island way back when. But um, she also gave me permission to write her story and I had recorded that. So I felt much better about that. I, was, I can tell sometimes people are like, well, you know, you really told her story, but maybe you didn't tell yours as much. And I just figure my kids don't need to know all my words and that of their family. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, it can be difficult. And I always warn people, be careful when you're friends with an author, because you never know when you're going to end up on a page. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, mm -hmm. Diana McDonough, this has been a great conversation. How can people m learn more about your books and about your work? Well, sure. All my books are on Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble. You can order them anywhere that Ingram services. And um, you can jump on my website at dianamcdonough.com and order the books from there as well, as well as local bookstores in the Maryland, Delaware, Virginia area. I thought. Well, fantastic. Are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? Oh, why not? <laughs> I had enough <laughs> coffee. I think I can handle it. <laughs> what is your favorite mm. color palette? Favorite color palette? Well, I think aquas, aquas and turquoise and teal is my basically my brand color. It's the color I like the best. I've had aqua carpet in the past. I have aqua walls. I tell myself I'm not picking anything else out that's aqua, but I always do. So anybody that knows <laughs> me knows that's my favorite. Color of the Caribbean. Exactly. Exactly. I was thinking Jamaica. And your next yeah, vacation. Oh, yeah, definitely. Which, oh, uh, actually, the end of Jamaica, 24th, I'm heading down, or head to Jamaica, end of January, I'm heading to Jamaica to do a research trip for my fourth book, which will be a sequel to Ginger Star. In Ginger Star, it talks about some actual British plantations, what they call great houses, and one of them is Bromley Penn. And I've been fortunate enough to get to know the owners there, and they have invited me to stay there in January. So I'm going to go there and do some true research on some real uh, British great houses and plantations to try and move forward with the next book. I'm excited about that. So that's my next vacation. And that's the best part about being a writer. We can, you know, Claim oh. research. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I'm excited. I didn't get to go for the last one for uh, Ginger Star, so I'm excited to go back. It's been I've done mission work in Jamaica for since 1995 and vacation down there. So I've been there over 60 times, and it's been almost four years since I've been there, and that's the longest stretch I've gone since 1995. So I can't wait to get back and see all my friends and make some new ones all along the way. Fantastic. And Diana, you are a big supporter of STEM and special needs uh, children. What has been oh, yeah. one of the proudest moments with that? Oh, my goodness. Well, again, uh, there's a blog I've written called The Summer of Juan and Pedro it's on my website. Um, my daughter is was at the time a vice principal. Now she's a principal of a special needs school. And there were two little boys that had a very serious issue called maple syrup urine disorder. When they eat too much protein, which is like over 10 grams a day, they go into neuro neurological distress. The parents could not keep them out of the hospital. The parents are Guatemalan, so there's a big language barrier there. So long story short, my daughter took them on during COVID or right before COVID hit. And uh, they were about three and five years old at the time. Huge commitment. It took her eight to 10 hours a week just to prepare their food. Anyway, I got to know them very well and um, became their surrogate grandmother and just love them to death. And as a result, I started volunteering one day a week at a special needs school. Just did it yesterday, as a matter of fact, showed up in my elf costume, delivering little presents to them. And they just bring me such joy. I walk out of there 12 inches off the ground every time I go, even on a normal day. And they're just, uh, that's why they call them special needs, because they're special, special people. I believe they're angels in our midst midst and uh, that's just stuck with me ever since. We also have a niece that's about 46 years old who's Down syndrome and that was my daughter's uh, inspiration to become a special needs teacher and principal. 
So Wendy's been an inspiration to all of us. She's definitely an angel in our midst. Diana and McDonough, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you, Allison. I really appreciate your time today and invite everybody to check out my website and go to Amazon and check out my books. Uh, don't think you'll be disappointed. They're also available in Kindle and ebooks, and Stuck in the Warranties is also in audiobooks through Amazon Audible. You have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison L. Boom. We're all done. All right. Thank you so much. Diana McDonough is an award-winning novelist and Maryland native. She is a Fort Myers snowbird. Diana's first novel, Stuck in the Onesies, grew out of her experiences living outside the nation's capital in the Maryland suburbs back in the 1960s and 70s when social issues first bubbled to the surface in the form of marches and riots. My Mother's Apprentice is the sequel to Stuck in the Onesies, the story of the next generation. Diana published her third novel, Ginger Star, a historical fiction, in December 2022, which is a prequel of Stuck in the Onesies and has the promise of a sequel. Discover more at dianamcdonough.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us at floridawriters.org. Until next time.